In the third quarter of the 19th century, the 1800s, Dartmouth received gifts to found four different colleges. One of them, the Chandler School of Science that came in the 1850s, and the Morrill Act and what became the Agricultural College in the uh, 1860s. The original correspondence from Thayer on Thayer came in the 1860s. And in 1875, a guy named Joel Parker gave money to found a law school. Now, of those four, Thayer's the only one that still exists. And if one had guessed back then, the one least likely to exist, it would have been Thayer. It begins with old Sylvanus himself. And I, I mean old. When the correspondence began with the president of Dartmouth, Asa Smith, he was already 82 years old. When I looked at that correspondence, I said, this is one weird sort of institution. He's imagining himself setting up. The literature talks about program A and program B. Program A is what people should know before they get to Thayer. It goes on for 200 typewritten pages. The idea of anyone being able to satisfy these abstracted entrance requirements is insane. By the time the school is getting set up, he's about ready to die. I think it started in, in 71, he dies in, in, in 72. They asked how many, I don't know, of well-known engineers to direct the operation, and they all refused. So they get a young guy named Robert Fletcher, who's 23 years old, and they put him in charge, and he's the only faculty member. The first year, they let some people in, but they couldn't possibly do the work. So that was financed a pre-engineering education so they could enter the school. That's why the first graduates don't come in 73. So it's not an auspicious start for something as ambitious that we had in, in there. But in 81, a process begins which gives Fletcher leverage. The process is one in which Smith, who had been president of the college, died in 77. The trustees had a tough time finding a successor. They uh, finally uh, got a man named Samuel Colcord Bartlett. He's an old-fashioned man. He doesn't like the fact that you've got this Chandler School of Science, which lets anyone in virtually who got through the common school system. So it's lower criteria for admission. They don't require classical languages. He doesn't like the agricultural school that's come. Later on, he, he publicly insults it. It's good for producing surveyors, selectmen, and legislators. And Bartlett gets himself in real trouble with the alumni. A group of New York alumni basically petitioned to have Bartlett fired. And Bartlett wants to take him on, so there's a public trial here. In the trial, there's only three faculty that testify for Bartlett, and they include our friend Robert Fletcher. And, and whatever he said in there, certainly he bought some leverage with Bartlett, who survived the trial. Fletcher's position and Thayer School's position and its independence from the Chandler School of Science were virtually guaranteed for another year. A decade later, Barlett has announced he is leaving the presidency. He's in his 70s. And in one year, a set of things happened that was the best thing that could possibly have happened for Thayer School. The successor to Barlett was William Jewett Tucker, if you know anything about the history of the college, the sequence of Tucker, Hopkins, and Dickey sort of turned Dartmouth from a declining regional institution into a major national and 
international institution. Dartmouth had a student body then of about 400. There's only about 10 of them in, in there. It's got a medical department. It's got the agricultural school. It's got the Chandler School of Science. And there's a lot of friction between the Chandler School and the regular academic faculty or the classical faculty, which you would call. Some of the Dartmouth faculty were teaching in the Chandler School, and there was a question of how much they were going to be paid. The Chandler people were angry with the Thayer School. Bartlett didn't like any of them because he wanted to produce ministers. But he retires, and Tucker engineered both before he became president, formally in late 93 or early 94, a massive kind of reorganization which set up the best years of Fletcher's directorship. The components were the Chandler School disappeared, got absorbed. And a second component of that was the, its only residue was a Chandler scientific course, which one could, it's like a major uh, today, and that it was done in a way where a, someone could use one of the options under the Chandler Scientific course as the first year of Thayer School. So you could get through with an engineering degree from Dartmouth at five years rather than six or more beyond that. It initiated uh, roughly 70 years in which uh, Thayer's main function was the service of Dartmouth students. This was an earlier version of the 3-2 of the program. The third thing was the disappearance of the agricultural school, it, now the UNH, it's the University of New Hampshire. And when they left, they had this building, their old experimental laboratory building that no one knew what to do with. The Thayer School, at that point in time, which had just been rooms in a couple of the rooms on Dartmouth Row, I think, moved in there. If it hadn't been for the presence of Samuel Colcord Bartlett and that bringing together of the elements in 1894 under a different president, it, it, it might have disappeared. What's beginning to happen still when uh, 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 Tucker's president, Dartmouth is having a presence now. You've got the medical department, you've got Tuck School, and then you've got Thayer School. No one's calling them associated schools yet, but there's a kind of a, a, a presence. It's not isolated in that. And the whole idea of this is not such an anomaly on campus, the peak of this period of growth in Thayer School was in 1911, in which they had 22 graduates, up from the one or two when it started, and six who were non-graduates who attended but uh, in the class but, but, but didn't graduate. Fletcher's getting along in years by now, and he retires in 18, which is only seven years later when he's 70 or 71 years old. Total enrollment in the school dropped like a rock. In 1922, there are only three graduates. It was so dramatic a change that in the middle of the 20s, Hopkins, who's president now, said to the dean, a guy named Holder, you've got two to four years to get your things straightened out, to which point Holder resigned. Suddenly the institution is in, in trouble again. And on what basis will it grow? Well, we don't know. The average in the 1920s did go up again to about seven, but never came close to the 22 graduates. Average in the 1930s, then we get the Great Depression, which can limit enrollment is about seven, two. He inhabited the deanship when two things happened that were essential to building the thriving institution that we all know in the post-World War II period. One was the uh, gift that built Cummings Hall. Cummings, the man who was Dartmouth graduate, had long been dead. 
But the year he graduated was absolutely critical. It was 62. And he was a classmate of Edward Tuck, the founder of the business school financially and Dartmouth's major donor in the entire first part of the 20th century. I bet the combination of Edward Tuck, who didn't die until just about this time, almost 1940, and Hopkins convinced Jeanette Cummings to use this considerable endowment to build what is Cummings Hall. It was a huge advantage to the institution for the fact that Tuck was already there and there was always the dining hall and the dormitories. So they, they could get them away from the undergraduate center of the campus. I'm guessing, but this is purely a guess, I've not seen any correspondence, that also Hopkins was especially interested in beefing up the Thayer School because of what he thought and was accurate in thinking would be a military confrontation. Because within the institution, the only part of the institution that had a military heritage was Thayer School. Now the West Point background. During World War I, they had been in charge of the students marching around campus. There was still a strong, strong linkage between the Army, particularly Army Corps of Engineers. In any case, World War II came along, and Thayer became an absolutely essential part of the training of the military during the V-12s. So by, by the end of World War II, the existence, continued existence of the Thayer School was no longer in doubt. And that's my quick 15-minute lecture on the early history of Thayer School.